Thanks for everybody being here tonight. Um, I'm going to try and condense 12 years of time into 12 minutes, and hopefully the juice will come out and be tasty. Um, in this day and age, it's tough to be a full-time artist. Sometimes you really have to have a part-time job, a, a day job. And I've had quite a few. Uh, a lot of them I've, <coughs> excuse me, I've shared with my wife. We've teamed up to be mural painters, and we worked for commercial projects and worked on some really big construction sites. And it was in those construction sites where I got the idea to paint contractors' plastic sheeting. I really loved the imagery uh, because it reminded me of the old master paintings with big draperies of brocades and wonderful silks that were rendered in an incredible way. But here was this temporary throwaway plastic that was being uh, used to protect uh, new work from work that was still going on. And uh, I just uh, loved its reflective transparency and the forms that it would make. It was uh, uh, always billowing in the slightest breeze and always changing with its reflective surface. It sort of paralleled somehow what painting was to me. But it wasn't until I took this plastic material outdoors that the metaphor really compounded and became meaningful to me. It was then that the, the plastic became a man-made material that prevented me from reaching uh, into, into nature, into nature's material. Uh, it became a, a kind of a petrochemical haze that prevented me to, from seeing into the woods. Uh, at the same time, it was this incredibly sparkly, reflective, glamorous, artificial surface that distracted me from the deeper issues of nature. And for all that profound meaning that this material started manifesting in my work, I was profoundly dissatisfied. I felt suffocated by the imagery, frankly. Uh, standing on this side of the plastic, always wanting to go beyond into nature, I was frustrated. And I really had this need to reach out beyond, be like the Wizard of Oz and pull back the curtain and find some meaning in nature with my work that I had no idea what it was. So I sort of just put my faith in the world and the universe and said, what am I going to do next? I reached out my hand, and the next thing I knew, I had a bucket of tar from the La Brea Tar Pits. And the, the people at the La Brea Tar Pits were so nice, I asked the Page Museum if I could take some home. They said, sure, kid, just don't spill it on the way out. And then later, after they saw the results of my work, they called me the Tartist. <laughs> yeah, I'm collecting it, and I was just so, so happy to get this stuff. I mean, buying Windsor Newton was never this exciting. <laughs> and so I took this stuff home to my studio and I turned it into paint as a substitute for paint. I, I started painting with the tar. Now, here's a fun fact the most, the most productive site single site in the world that produces fossils from the Ice Age is not in the Sahara Desert. It's not under the ice pack of the Antarctic. It's on Wilshire Boulevard next to the LA County Museum. And to me, this is like having a time machine in your backyard. It, really, to be honest, to me, it's a sacred site. Um, it is a place that has transformed the way I see the world. That it, I call home. Uh, it, it shows me how much the environment has changed in a short time, relatively short time, and how much it continues to change and suggests that it will always change. That's sacred to me. <coughs> Here's my art store. Some people call it a, a laboratory for science, but uh, we all call it Pit 91. <laughs> and this is where I pulled out my tar. And uh, as I was saying about the plastic, this tar is also a petrochemical. And it is at the center of the current ecological crisis that we're facing. 
If we didn't dig it out of the ground and burn it, we wouldn't be having the climate change we're experiencing. And every time I paint something with this material, it's tarred with that very sad fact. Also, but there's another side. Uh, when I uh, paint an object, it is also tarred with the fact that tar is this primordial goo. It itself was once alive, and it was geological process over millions of years that cooked it into this sticky goo that bubbled up into the future side of Wilshire Boulevard. And the animals that were captured in that sticky goo so long ago that no longer exist are also physical evidence of the cycles of extinction and evolution. And so that context, that framework, is something I couldn't buy at Blick Art Store, but I could get it at Pit 91. <laughs> so here I am, I'm all set up with great ideas, but what am I going to do with this shit, right? <laughs> so uh, I, I had to figure out how to make it into paint. It's sort of uh, based on the asphaltum that you use in printmaking. So uh, I devised this simple composition. It was actually based on uh, the inspiration of Galileo's drawings of the moons, but basically it's test strips. And I made every orb here that you see uh, in a different recipe, a different technique, I was teaching myself how to paint with tar. I'll jump ahead for a moment just to show you this picture of something I'm just finishing. And this is a painting of the moon made in tar, painted on an antique mirror. It's called the reflector. Because after all, the moon is a reflecting object. It doesn't have a light source. So the, uh, the moon that you see here, the light bits are just the parts of the mirror that are showing through. And you can actually see yourself as the man in the moon. Um, but uh, I want to go back to my earlier process. In the beginning, I just made stains. I just let the tar, I lay down the panel on the ground so it's flat bed. I would just pour tar in water, let it mix, let it go wild. I didn't know what was going to happen. Like a Rorschach blot, I would look at the, the thing hanging on my wall and try and find animals in it. Uh, you can see there's the beginning of a rabbit forming here. And with a little bit of refinement, uh, it became even more clear. Um, just so you understand my process, I'm using the tar almost like a scratch board. I'm using a very sharp instrument to scratch away the white lines, building the animal hair by hair in some cases. But the, the point I want to make here is that I was using the, the natural condition, the natural, natural materiality of the tar to just let it do stuff and then say, and what's that? Uh, Leonardo talked about that stuff, seeing walls with stains and seeing images in it. But, you know, it's just what humans do. Probably the guys who painted on caves did the same thing. There was once a, a dark pool of tar here that I had no idea what to do with, but it became a bird of prey. Or the swirl of tar that was mixing with water became the dome of the cranium of this dog. Here the, uh, the mountain lion, uh, the effort was to balance it so it really looked almost like it was emerging from the tar or perhaps decaying into the tar. Mm -hmm. Is it coming or going? Which way? Which way is an animal like that facing extinction going? <coughs> One of the things I noticed when I was working with tar, painting animals, was that I was becoming more and more like a method actor. I would really try and put myself inside the animal, inhabit imaginatively the animal's body. What's it like to live in a body that doesn't look like mine at all? And uh, it was an effort to really try and feel another. And that, for me, was transform transformative. Um, I can say here, when I was trying to do this one, I had one hell of a neck ache. But that's <laughs> <a joke. laughs> now, I was really trying to, to give the animals a sense of individuality, a sense of self-awareness. And if I achieved that, I thought that the painting was done, I could move on. I want to show you this just to say that even when I'm rendering a lot of volume and form, illusionistic space in the paintings, uh, something that gets lost 
in the photographs is that the presence of the tar surface is always there. And so here where the flash of the camera is catching that tar, you kind of get a sense that even when the animal is really volumetrically uh, rendered, like in this uh, drawing of an Akapi, which lives at the LA Zoo, uh, since the ones in Madagascar are out of my range, but also near extinction, uh, that the tar is really, really present. And uh, it, it's, for me, that metaphor that really uh, individuality really does come out of materiality. But I want to say here that these paintings really boil down to being able to stare into the eyes of another species, have it stare back at me somehow, and really feel a resonance. It's the beginning of a sense of compassion that is the opposite of what we were looking at when I was just painting plastic. In this painting, I left a hole in the center of this bear. And to me, you know, a poet doesn't have to explain the meaning of the poem, but I just want to say that, well, uh, there's sort of a galactic form here, and I can say, oh, well, it's the, the existential hole at the center of the universe we'll never understand. Or I could say, it's just the feeling that an animal has that wakes it up in the morning and makes it want to go look for food or look for love, or look for anything, just to look. Uh, that's the motivation I had when I was struggling with that, uh, that plastic that was sealing me off, that was uh, obscuring. As, as much as I love those paintings, as much as they mean so much to me, the transformative process of experimenting with this new material and it, the resonance it brought to the work the, the time that I have spent just trying to, I suppose, be more emotional, be more feeling, be more responsive to others, uh, that's a challenge that'll last me a lifetime. So while that uh, project that we started the show with here was a nice, closed, compact project, this is an open-ended project I will never live to see the end of. It also considers the audience in a way that uh, I think anybody considering mixing science and art has to consider, is what are you trying to really motivate in the audience? And so I'm closing here with this last picture that is a portrait of the artist as a young crow. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> it's really the ultimate scavenger. Uh, it's a, trying to look for anything and everything and it's using a tool to do it, like a paintbrush. And uh, maybe I even beat the 12 minutes, I'm not sure. Uh. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.